I want to welcome everyone tonight. Um, tonight's talk uh, is one of many examples of the New School's engagement with India. Um, our engagement with India is also evident in a number of other areas, including fellowships and scholarly exchanges uh, we have uh, that have been facilitated by um, the India-China Institute. Um, Parsons Mumbai, uh, which just opened up in, in, in July, which is a new partnership that we have with the Indian uh, Institute for Design and Innovation. There are a growing number of our students are coming uh, to the new school from India, and, um, and there's also a wide range of research projects our faculty and students are doing in India. I think increasing globalization uh, makes our partnerships and in initiatives in India and with India even more, more essential. Um, these are partnerships where creativity and innovation guide approaches to exploring critical issues of, uh, critical issues of the day. It also reflects our focus on both urban and global issues, um, which is really where the world is headed. And finally, uh, it's our commitment to social justice and access to education, which really runs deep here. And we're really pleased to have with us tonight um, Professor Sukdeo Torat. Uh, he embodies our, our shared values of social engagement and social justice and social, social innovation. And he's worked to connect those values in his work uh, around education reform. Over time, his scholarship has explored problems of excluded groups, um, socially inclusive growth, caste and economic uh, discrimination, and higher education, just to, just to name a, a few. He is currently uh, a professor of economics at the Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University, where he's also the chair of the Indian Council of Social Science Research in New Delhi. He is the former chair of the University Grant Commission, where he served from 2006 to 2011 uh, as an educational advisor to Prime, uh, Prime Minister uh, Menmohan Singh. In that role, he oversaw the only grant-giving agency in India vested with responsibility not only to provide funds, but also to set uh, high standards for higher education institutions. He's also been a major advocate for social change in India from a very young age. Drawing from his experiences growing up in a small farming village of Mahimapur, he witnessed poverty and discrimination uh, firsthand. And he's been, from that experience, he's been a strong advocate of equal rights for Dalits, untouchables, during the 19, 1960s. He's won a number of awards, uh, including the Padmashri Award, which is granted by the Government of India uh, for his contribution to promoting public service and education, and the Mother Teresa International Award, given by the All India Minority and Weaker Section Council in Kolkata. Uh, which, which awards outstanding achievement and contribution to minorities in weaker sections. His research and contributions have helped to develop government policies, encourage the teaching and research of marginalized groups in India, and influence the strategies of funding agencies such as the World Bank and UNICEF. His current research is focusing on a range of issues, including agricultural development, rural poverty, problems of marginalized groups, economics of caste systems, caste discrimination and poverty, human development, and higher education reform. Given all that, we're fortunate that he could even spend some time with us. But we're really pleased to have you. So join me in welcoming uh, Professor, uh, Professor Torat. Good evening. Well, thank you very much for a nice word about me. Uh, Thank you very much to Ashok Gurung for uh, inviting me here to be uh, with you and see this new school with new ideas and new imaginations. Um, when I discussed with him uh, uh, as to what should I speak on, and I gave him a couple of issues, so he said that a higher education with which I was engaged for a five years in developing some policy of openness Uh, would be the better topic, and therefore uh, I decided to speak today uh, on the issue of higher education. But uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here. Uh, I have been associated with uh, the edu institutions uh, which are engaged into new ideas, new issues, finding out the, getting out of the regular research framework and find out new answers to the questions. I set up an institute, Indian Institute of Delhi Studies, uh, which entirely focus on the problem of excluded group, because the, this research and study of this group doesn't f 
find enough space in the mainstream social science research. Uh, so an institution was set up, NGOs are involved in that. Uh, Narula knows about it. Uh, but also when I was the chairman of the UGC, I set up 32 centers uh, called Social Exclusion and Inclusive Policies. And now there is a research, and a lot of young people who want to do a research different from the mainstream research are now engaged in these centers. Uh, therefore, I am quite excited here. Uh, it's all different thing that I see. Uh, maybe I, uh, I'd come and spend some time, some other time. Yeah. Well, let me move on to the topic, uh, uh, higher education in India, emerging challenges of access and diversity. I wish to uh, discuss a couple of issues of higher education. Uh, one, I'll give you a story of status of higher education, and uh, uh, Mr. President, you have made a mention of openness and new initiative in higher education. I'll share about those uh, issues, particularly the development of higher education. Uh, since the 60s and at a much rapid rate uh, in the 2000. After having done that, then nevertheless, I would like to pose certain problems uh, that we are facing, discuss certain problems. Uh, and I will focus on only four of them, that is disparity in access, diversity on the campus and the issue related to diversity, uh, mainly not only diversity, but issue related to discrimination and gender aspects, uh, the problem associated with the academic diversity, uh, and then how to deal with diversity, uh, social diversity, discrimination and differences in academic achievement, and would like to have your comments and views on, on some of this issue because we have not made beginning in some respects. In some we have, but not in all, but USA is far ahead of dealing with diversity and issue related to discrimination on the campus in higher education institutions. Let me, before I go to the higher education uh, as such, let me give you an idea as to what, uh, what is the nature of the education system in India. In India, if you start with the schooling, uh, the, our school ends uh, uh, with the 10th standard. So you begin with first and your schooling ends with 10th standard. Then there are two more intermediate year. They are called higher secondary, but they are counted in uh, school. And the after the twelfth standard or higher secondary, once you enter into the degree program, and that degree program, as usually, you have four year. We have three year. So degree with three year and postgraduate with two years, and then PhD with number of years. So degree onward is counted as. Uh, so higher education is in fact plus three undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD, postgraduate diploma. So uh, that is an United Nations definition also, that the higher education is the one which includes the student that goes to the uh, degree program after the schooling. Uh, it is this uh, definition that I'll use later. What we have is uh, unlike USA, where there are unitary universities, that you have undergraduate, postgraduate, and PhD student house in one mm, program, same teacher teaches undergraduate and the postgraduate and possibly advise PhD student. We, we, have, we don't have the unitary system except in some of the central university. I'll come to that later. But, may, but predominantly our system is an affiliating system that you have university where postgraduate, that is master degrees and the PhD student takes admission the undergraduate students are in colleges. You have colleges here also. And these colleges are then, then affiliated to the university for award of degree. So we, what we have the, the affiliating colleges system and not the unitary system where undergraduate is also a part of the university system. But there are independent institutions with right to award degrees. This is an sort of an exception. They are called uh, institution of national importance. So you might have heard about the uh, uh, Institute of Technology or Institute of Management, very famous and very popular. They appeared quite often in this list, times list of 200 or uh, odd number. So there are institutes which have a uh, degree awarding right. They are not university, but they are called National Institutes of Importance and they have degree awarding right. This is the structure that you have. This is the number 
uh, that you have that universities are of different types in terms of their legal definition. So central university, there are about 44 of them. These are set up by the government through the Act of Parliament and they are funded 100% by the central government. State government, the provincial government do not have any say uh, as far as the central universities are concerned. Then you have state university, these are provincial universities. The center cannot interfere, they are set up under the act of the state legislative council or the state government and they are, they account the bulk of the universities in the country. Then there are 129 or 30 deemed universities, this is a very uh, funny type of uh, universities. If somebody has some organization has set up an educational institution, you are allowed to set up under Societies Act or as a trust, you can set up an institutions and run postgraduate and graduate courses. And if you acquire a good status that you are almost like an university, then you can, uh, you can apply to the University Grant Commission and get a university status. So they are not university, but they are deemed to be universities, but they have, they have right to award degree. So they are as good as uh, the universities. So there are about 130 of them. And then, as I told you, there are institutions of national importance. Uh, four of them are in state, and 33 are in, uh, na in the, uh, of a national character, and the number must have increased quite substantially now. Now, there is a recent phenomenon that we did not have private universities in your country. But recently, the, out of this deemed university, almost 80% are private universities in the sense that they don't get funding from the government, they depend on their f own finances, whatever they are called self-financing institutions. Um, but in the states also, under the pressure, uh, the state government has started setting up state private university. They have a right to uh, set up universities. Uh, law doesn't uh, bar them from doing so. So there are about 111, number might have increased to 120. These are set up by the state, uh, through the state mechanism, but they are self-financing university. They don't get grant. They largely depend on tuition. So this is the structure. And then, of course, you have maybe 40,000 or around 45,000 colleges, uh, which offer an undergraduate program in various disciplines. This is the broadly a structure of uh, a university system. Um, the state ha central has a much less role and it is the state governments and provincial government which play a major role. So uh, you can see here that the states, we can divide this into a state and the private sector. So state sector is the central university which are 44. Then some of the deemed universities are by the government, 13 or 14 of them. So 260 for example, 266 state university, 44 central university, 10, 10 of the deemed university, and most of the national institute of importance are in the state domain. Private sector include two categories, and you must understand that because that issue is very important when I come to access. We have a private institutions, but they are aided by the government, almost 80%, 70%. So in terms of their rule and working, they are almost like a government organizations. Therefore, uh, they are called uh, government aided and uh, they are similar to that of government. I have not written here, I should have written here. Private include basically, as I said, this uh, government, uh, the colleges, uh, they are not aided, they are self-financing and there are state university which are private. Now let me take you to the uh, little history about the development of higher education in the country. The, we got independent in 1947, so all the state, all the universities uh, and the colleges till the beginning of the 19th century were set up under the uh, British Act of Higher Education. Uh, it is only after 1930s and 40s that government of India Act, Education Act was passed, and more clearly, of course, after 1947 when we got independence. Immediate step was taken by the government of India, and a, a body called University Grant Commission was set up in 1953, of which I was a chairman during 2006 and 2011. Uh, 
so higher education is looked after by university grant commission and the ministry of education university grant commission is the highest body uh, which provide funding to all universities central state uh, institution of national importance and ministry also support them there is a division between center and the state and uh, we have one particular word that we we uh, we call it that if you want to divide the power of the indian government Uh, we call it the power of the central government union government and the power of the provincial government state government but there is a th third category and that is our con concurrent list there is a list wherein both center and state have some power education falls in concurrent list higher education fall in concurrent not the school education and in as far as this concurrent list is concerned the central government has a limited power and that is to coordinate and and maintain the standard and monitor monitor the standard across the country so that there is an uniformity state have the right to set up universities take uh, decision uh, the way they want uh, in many respect but as far as the curriculum is concerned examination system is concerned length of the degree is concerned there are certain regulation which are binding on them which are enforced by the university grant commission and the ministry of education so central government's role is to have an some sort of an uniformity not that variation is not allowed but uniformity standards are maintained and accountability uh, is ensured with respect to uh some of this aspect i just want to discuss this particular period uh, because uh, the president also made the mention a new initiative was taken in 2006 and this is precisely the period uh, uh, when i was the chairman of the ugc i am mentioning not because i was the chairman but this is indeed a period when uh, higher education really got a very high uh, allocation and uh, progress In 2006, uh, in 2011, is also coincide with what is called economic plan. We have a planning system, uh, and we plan for five year. So 2006 and 2011 is is a period which also coincide with the 11 plan, where the policies are reviewed uh, and the new plans are made. And it is there that, as a chairman of the UGC, I had an opportunity to make a presentation to the Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Uh, He is an economist. I am an economist, so we have some professional association. So I made a presentation and shared the status of affair in higher education, which was not quite satisfactory. He understood. He was a professor for several decades in one of the university in India. He understood, and then uh, in eleven plan in two thousand six, a special plan was made for strengthening and expansion of higher education in the country. from 4000 crore the allocation to higher education in the 10th plan that is before 2006 was 4000 crore it increased to 47000 crore 11 time increase to the higher education uh, so it led to the uh, the allocation was increased many fold the developmental grant to the central university and to the state universities uh, were increased to the colleges it was increased the other problem was quality of teacher uh, there were policies which had discouraged the youth, uh, youth to go for academic positions that had to be revised and one of the reason was that the salaries were not compatible with the private sector or at least they were not Was adequate enough to attract the academician to the uh, teaching profession, so it also coincides with the pay commission. Uh, every ten year, we the government revise the pay of government employee and the teacher. So the eleventh plan, two thousand six, also coincides with the pay commission, and we really fought and argue with the ministry that you have to, if you want to attract the talent, the salaries of the teacher should be at least on par with the government officers, elite government service. what is called indian uh, civil service or indian foreign service otherwise the best will go to uh, administrative service and the private sector government understood and a very good package were given to the university and college teacher which is almost comparable to the uh, indian administrative service which is a elite service several academic reform were in introduced uh, particularly uh, semester system credit and grading system 
uh, evaluation of the teachers. This was not uniformly practiced everywhere. So there were a number of academic reform which were undertaken. But one of the important uh, 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 issue was the cross-country collaboration. Indian education system was fairly restrictive. And at that time, the, chief, the minister was Kapil Sibbal. And he took a major initiative to uh, take the Indian education, uh, to make the Indi uh, Indian education more open, both in terms of mobility of Indian students to other countries and vice versa. But more importantly, the some initiatives were taken at two levels. Uh, he passed, prepared a bill for setting up of universities, foreign university in India. And that bill is still with the central government. It has not been yet cleared. But the other route of uh, cross-country collaboration, namely inter-university and inter-institution collaboration, uh, that has been now uh, formalized so that various institutions can uh, get engaged through a collaboration, can have a joint program, joint degree program. Student can come to USA and uh, attend the courses and carry forward the credit. Uh, same is the case with the U.S. student. They can go do courses and carry forward their credit. And degrees can be awarded jointly or by one single university. There is a cost sharing. So a lot more liberalization and uh, change has been introduced as far as the uh, uh, collaboration with the, uh, between the institution is concerned. There is a huge opportunity for this uh, school like New School to enter into the uh, collaboration with many educational institutions in the country uh, which provide a legal support and which provide other support uh, uh, also. I think this, is, this was a major uh, change uh, that happened in the uh, higher education. Well, there were other changes uh, we, I would like to mention later. Now, with this background, now let me come to what are the issues that we are confronting. And I would like to have a discussion at the end and give, listen to your views uh, as to is there anything learning from the U.S. system. Um, the higher education access is, uh, uh, the access, uh, access and development of higher education is measured through what is called gross enrollment ratio. And that gross enrollment ratio means that uh, in Indian system, a student with the age group, a person with the age group of 18, educated with the age group of 18 should, en should enter into the first degree uh, and complete at least uh, uh, the first degree by the age of 22 or 23rd. Therefore, this gross enrollment ratio, which is internationally used, is nothing, is that the student in the age group of 18 to 22, which are registered in the various educational institutions, as a ratio of the total population in the age group of 18 to 22. So that of the total population in that age group, 18 to 22, what proportion of the students are going uh, into higher education? And that is a measure which is used everywhere to study the level of development of higher education in the countries. It is this ratio I will use uh, 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 to tell you the development. But I will also study the, the, I will also present the variation while we, while we uh, have a look at the aggregate level, at the level of the country, we also look the disparity in access. And that disparity in access, uh, I will present before you by their economic background, poor, non-poor, by gender background, and by some ethnic, caste, and religious background, so that we get the picture of both. Uh, if uh, by economic background means I'll present you the figure uh, in, of enrollment by occupation group, by income level, for gender, male, female, rural, urban, and caste, ethnic, and religious group. Uh, the caste group is something like uh, counterpart is, I think, African-American, ethnic is indigenous community, and religious minorities, of course, you can understand. So we have fortunately data across these groups, and we can estimate the access to higher education. This is a gross enrollment ratio by sector and gender. You can very easily see that uh, the ratio uh, in rural area is lower than the urban area. Let me tell you how we define rural area. Rural area is a settlement where the, the population is 5,000, and less than 75% of the workers are engaged 
uh, in non-farm sector. So predominantly they are dependent on agriculture. So there is a specific defi definition of rural area. So you can very easily see that uh, the figure for rural area is 11 percent as against 30 30 percent for the urban area. Now similar disparities you can see in male and female. At the aggregate level, the disparity is not large, but nevertheless, the, in rural area, you can see that the male GER is 13, while female GER is 8.3. In urban area, the difference is much less between the male and female. So that's a positive aspect, that in urban area, female have been able to catch up with the male. But in a rural area, you can see the difference. Uh, so there are rural and urban disparities and male and female disparity, particularly in, uh, in uh, rural area. Okay, this is by social group. This is for 2010. This is the very latest figure, 2010-2009. Now, if you take sh uh, scheduled tribe, which are indigenous people, you take scheduled caste, which are uh, low caste, and their counterpart is African-American. Uh, OBC is the other backward caste communities, and others are higher caste. We have this caste system where there is a caste hierarchy. Now, you can very easily see the as you go up in the caste hierarchy from ST to SC and OBC and others, the enrollment rate goes up. If you can see that if you take indigenous community, their enrollment is 7% as against 26% among the other, and average is 17%. Or SC, it is 11% as against 26% for others. So there are intersocial group disparities beside rural, urban, and male, female. If you come to the religious group, uh, you see the disparities. Uh, the Hindus, of course, are the 85% uh, population in the country. But you can see that the, the Christians are doing much better. Uh, Jains are doing f the highest uh, ratio you find among the Jains. It's a, it's a trading and business uh, religious group. But it is followed by Christians. And then, to some extent, are the Sikhs. Uh, but rest of them, you can say here, you can see Muslim are lagging behind, Buddhists are lagging behind, and to a certain extent, even Hindus are lagging behind. So there are inter-religious group disparities as such. Muslims are particularly lagging lagging behind, followed by Sikh and and and, and Buddhist. So we have inter-religious group disparities. Let's come to the economic now. Forget about the social background. Let's take just the poverty. Now, th these are five rural areas, these are five occupational groups. These are simple group. You have farmer who have lands, so they have asset, and you have those who have private entrepreneurs. Now, as against, you have wage laborer, the agricultural wage laborer and non-agricultural laborer. So you can have two classes, those who have access to asset, farmer and uh, private entrepreneurs, and you have agricultural laborer and non-agricultural laborer. You can very easily see that those who have asset and resources, their enrollment is close to 12%. As against 4% for agricultural laborer, bulk of them are in rural area, and 6% for non agricultural laborer. So, very clear disparities across the occupation group. Same is the story in urban area that the, those who own enterprises and are business, their enrollment ratio is 24%. Those who have regular salary, they do the best, 33%. But the casual labor, those engaged in construction and odd work, their enrollment ratio dropped down to almost 8%. This disp economic disparity you can see in urban area. Well, forgetting the rural and urban, and you take the income, this is the story that emerged. These are the income classes. Uh, bottom 20%, then 20 to 40%, 40 to 60%, and top 80 to 100%, income level. You take, uh, this is, you go down in the income slab, and you can very easily see that the top economic group, uh, 80 to 100% bracket, Enrollment ratio is almost 38%, as against 5% for the poor, 8% for the next lab, and the, it, goes, uh, it goes down. So the access to higher education is determined. Let me summarize now. Uh, so access to higher education is then de uh, determined by two, three considerations. First, by your income, which is also reflected through income. The poor, agricultural laborer, non-agricultural laborer in rural area and urban area have much less access to 
the higher education although there is a system there is a vocational education for them because those who cannot go for higher education and yet uh, their proportion is lower among the social group the indigenous communities the excluded group of scheduled castes and untouchables among the religious group muslim and the buddhist lag behind so these are the disparities that we see in india in access to higher education but the important point that i want to mention is this that at a aggregate level the enrollment ratio is just 17% country as a whole only 17% of the youth in the age group of 18 to 22 enter into higher education it's very low compared to 37 35% for middle income group and of course it's very low compared to the developed countries like europe and usa where the enrollment is 50% 60% 70% so we are long way behind as far as access to higher education is concerned the indian presence in academia is very much evidence even in usa but that is because of number because it's a big number a 1% of a uh, big population going into higher education makes huge difference and also then a particular section which has a history of access to higher education uh, they they manage to do better uh, either in india or outside india now let me come to the diversity now for diversity i use a different ratio in diversity what i have done is because if you want to study the diversity on the university campus for example new school how do you see you take total student in the university and work out the percentage of different group work out the percentages of male and female how what percentage of students are female vis a vis male what percentage of students are african american what percentage of students are latino uh, what percentage of students are from asian countries that's how uh, uh, and you get percentage of those who are poor non poor so you get the diversity diversified character of the student if you take the ratio of each of them into total and that some that will add up to 100 so that is what i am presenting you very briefly you can see here that out of the this is the rural urban uh, and male female you can see that about uh, the the proportion of the urban is about 56 and pr proportion of rural is about 43 so urban share in the total student population is slightly higher than the rural but there is a presence of student coming from the rural area huge presence in university and the colleges as far as gender is concerned female share is 42 male share is 57 or 58 but nevertheless 42% of the students are girls so you have a combination of boys and girls you don't have just male uh, but you have girls also so you have girls and you have student coming from rural and urban area that is the diverse character by social group if you take the scheduled caste scheduled tribe obc and others which we have seen and the last column is the down below is 100 what you can say is that again Uh, and I, I have given the population share also, so you can see that for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, their share in higher education student population is lower than their share in population. While for OBC uh, it is close to their population share, but for others their population share is just thirty percent, but their share in the student population is forty-eight percent. They are more represented in the higher education. But nevertheless. for the from the point of view of diversity i'll come to the problem of diversity later from the point of view of diversity you do have student from indigenous community you do have student from low caste high caste from rural area girls and male so that is the composition of the population that you have uh, in the university in indian campus same is the story about religious uh, last column gives you that hindu obviously dominate uh in the student population but their population is also very high 81% of the population is hindu and therefore they account 85% uh, population of the students slightly higher than their population share but look at the muslim they account 13% of the population but their share in the student population is 8% less than their share in the uh, uh population christian their share is higher than their population share sikh share is higher than their population share jain share is higher than their population share buddhist also fairly uh, well but muslim really lags behind but what is important is that 
the student from all the religious community are on the campus. They come with their values, attitudes, stereotype, and that brings diversity. Similarly, you have a student from poor and non-poor background, although, as you can see here, out of the total student, almost 47% are from a uh, non-poor background, 47%, followed by second category, but from the poor backgrounds are less, 5%, 9%, 13%. But nevertheless, because of fellowship and scholarship, you have a student who are really poor and we have a student who are really rich, living, in the, living together on the campus, We're coming with a different background. And it has a significance. Uh, this is this is this is showing a change that uh, the between 83 and 2014 you can see that the proportion of those in with a higher income bracket has increased from 37 to 53 percent, but that of poor has declined. Poor declined from 8 percent to 2 percent. Second to poor declined from 8 to 6 percent. Down below declined from 19 to 12 percent. Another declined for 26 to 23 percent, but higher income bracket share in the total student population has increased from 30, 37 percent to 53 percent. Well, what is the nature of diversity then uh, in the Indian university and the colleges? The nature of diversity is the following. The student composition is diversified in terms of rural urban, is no more rural uh, urban alone. If you go, uh, go, go back to the early 19th century, what was the combination? The combination was urban, male, high caste. That was the uh, unilateral combination in the universities and, and the colleges. Urban, male, and high caste. Now there is a change for last 50 years. What is that change? Change is that you have students from rural and urban. You have female now. In addition to high caste, you have low caste. You have indigenous people and from different religion, and also from the poor. Now this is the stock of the student that comes to the university. Is there a problem? Are there issues of diverse background? We'll see that, and he, it is here that I would like to learn something from US experience. The third disparity is academic disparities. With diversity in their economic and social background and religious background, there is also diversity disparities in the academic standing with which they enter into the university. Even if they meet the minimum qualification through entrance test, and yet their academic standing varies, and that has its own consequences on for uh, uh, outcomes in the uh, uh, in the college and the university. Now, what I have done is that there is no data about the academic performance uh, of marks and other thing. I have taken two indicators, namely, what is the proportion of the student from private and public? Private schools, private uh, so private. Universities and institutions are the elite school, elite institution. Where tuition is very high, it is relatively better of student who can go afford to go, and they are supposed to be then, since they are coming from a better school, they are supposed to be academically better. So if we look at the division of student between public and the private, uh, we get a certain idea about their academic standing. Second is the language. There are English medium school and there are national uh, language school and the state language school. And invariably those who goes to the English medium school also happens to be those who goes to the private school and their academic background is uh, much, much better compared to those who come from original languages, those who come from public sc school institutions. So it is with respect to these two things that I, two indicators that I am sh uh, impressing upon you, the disparities in the academic background and academic standing of the student. Here is, the, here is the one table which gives you the division between the public and the private. In 2007, you can see that the government and local bodies, which are public state bodies, about 48% of the student population is from government operated or supported institutions, followed by 30% private aided. They are also as good as the uh, government institutions. But 22% of the students are in private. That is very, very important. These are all self-financing, supported institutions. The important point that you have to remember from this table is that the, the proportion of those who were in private unaided, elite 
private institutions self financing was only 7% in 1995 it had jumped to 22% in 2007 and it must have gone to almost one third so you can see the privatization of the higher education uh, in india moving at a very fast rate and as a result uh, you can see that the uh, you can see that the 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 share of the public institution is going down particularly share of the private aided is going down so privatization of higher education uh, with a self financing institution is a key feature that you can notice and it has its implication for uh, access now in terms of social background who goes to private institutions so i have only focused the rate part that is private unaided self financing institution you can very easily see that the indigenous community the low caste proportion is 17 and 14 but as you go to others the proportion increases 25 and 21 while the average is 22 so the indigenous people and the low caste communities proportion in private institution is less compared to the higher caste but their share in the public is very high 60 percent can you see it here the scheduled tribe 60 percent scheduled caste 53 percent compared to the other so they depend in the pu in public institution where the quality issue is an, is an issue this is income this is very important look at the uh, figure that are highlighted just take private unaided self-financing institution and you can see that the share of the poor is low and as you go in the income bracket category the share increases average is 22 which i had shared with you but it is 27 percent or 28 percent for the higher income group followed by 17 percent in the middle income group but much less uh, for the lower income group so it is only relatively better off that they go into the private institution well i will avoid this i will not complicate the matter but let me summarize that as far as the private and public background is concerned the high caste urban and poor uh, and the relatively better off goes into the private institutions which are english medium invariably in english medium better quality institutions so by providing an unequal opportunity in learning we are also creating unequal capacities and the low caste the indigenous people the poor the muslims and others other minorities excluding christians uh, they depend more on the public institution now language is the other indicators of quality and i have given here rural urban now you can see uh, just focus on the english and forget about other languages for the, for the sake of uh, uh, understanding you can see that in rural area 32 34 percent of the student of the total student in rural area going to higher education 34 percent of them goes to the english medium institutions as against 60 percent in the urban area you can very easily see the disparities if you look at the social background uh, you get the similar picture that a lower proportion of scheduled tribe scheduled caste goes to the english medium school and higher proportion of the uh, those from other backward caste and higher caste goes to the english medium school uh, english medium higher education institutions same patterns you can see access and the quality with respect to income focus on the in english only you can see that the poorer group only 19 percent or 29 percent goes to the english medium higher education institution as against 38 percent or 41 percent for the non-poor uh, group now i have presented this story to you that let me summarize now that we have expanded like anything in higher education our enrollment ratio was only one percent in 1950 now it is about 18 percent close to 20 percent one fifth of although it is very low but there are disparity in access and that disparity is 
we have seen that indigenous population, low caste, some group of religious minority, poor, rural area and girls in rural area, they lag behind compared to male, compared to student from urban area, high caste and non-poor. But nevertheless, when access is thus unequal. Now, should we have an unequal access is an issue, the first issue. Low access to ST, SC and Muslim, low access to girls, rural girls, private sector in higher education reduce access for the poor, and expansion, uh, that, is, that is the issue of access that we can see. Now there are there are number of fundamental issues uh, here as far as the access is concerned. Education is a public good. Everybody should have an opportunity to expand the capacity. And then you leave it to leave the student to the market. Market will take care in terms of their capacities. But at least one should provide an equal opportunity to everybody to expand their capacities. We cannot say that some will get good quality educations or some will not get, and some will get less quality education or some will not get education at all. So education should not become a source of inequality. If you look at Europe, for example, uh, there is hardly any private university or U even UK for that matter, although the tuition fee varies, but except the Birmingham University, no, no other university is private and self-financing. But there are self-financing university in Europe where they have a financial support. They have developed mechanism. There is nothing wrong with the private, but you have to, if you have a uh, substantial financial support to those who are poor and meritorious would get admission, then you deal with those problems also. Now, therefore, uh, this is an issue of unequal access, how to deal with it. I am leaving this uh, issue because uh, uh, maybe we can discuss and you can tell me how do you, you deal with the issue of access in U.S. How do we deal with diversity? And this is a very important. There's a diversity in multiculture. A student come from rural area. Uh, he come from low caste, indigenous communities, uh, regional, uh, the, the background is different. Now, the student come with a different values and notion in life. And that creates problems. One of the problem of uh, 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 diversity is often lead to discrimination also. You have the problem of caste discrimination, discrimination associated with ethnic background. Uh, I'm going to come to uh, religion, uh, 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 gender separately, but the issues are that if you have a diversified student, then you have the problem of discrimination between the student, between the uh, student and the teacher, inside the classroom, outside the classroom on the campus. How to deal with the diversity? If they say that the teacher, education institution have a special responsibility to create a civic culture among the youth. If you have to measure the democracy, you can measure it by the kind of education that you provide to the youth. Uh, that they turn with the values that support democracy, the concept of equity, uh, equal status, and several other values. Education has that responsibility. Education doesn't have responsibility of giving skill only uh, or giving scientific knowledge. It has also responsibility of giving values and civic culture, and I think USA has recognized that. As back as 1995, I think the American College Association of College and University had set up a committee, worked for two years, and brought out those five wonderful reports, how to deal with diversity through curriculum, uh, through, inter uh, through uh, teaching in the class, uh, through intergroup discussions around certain common values, and I think it has paid quite a lot. But we have not made a beginning at all as far as the diversity is concerned. On the contrary, it leads to the issue of differentiation, uh, intergroup conflict, uh, and uh, the group formation around, around the identity, caste, ethnicity, and other identities which doesn't create an atmosphere of uh, uh, developing a student uh, with a common goal as such. It also creates the problem of gender relation. We are facing a tough issue. Uh, now that in urban area, even ha half of the students are girls. In rural area, they are less. 
the student with different religious and cultural background enter on the campus with a different set of notions and attitude and stereotype in terms of behavior towards girls and therefore the problem of gender harassment sexual harassment uh, is a genuine problem that we face i think it is it is picking up now uh, in my own university there was a there were series of incidences so vice chancellor set up a president set up a committee i am a member of that and uh, we don't know how to deal with it we know only legal ways of dealing with it uh, we have a um, uh, gender harassment office if there is gender harassment by the, of the girl she will go and lodge a complaint so or counseling services but the positive education program through curriculum uh, uh, the sex education the gender education uh, and uh, dealing with the different values of the students coming with a different background uh, teaching them that uh, these are the value which need to be retained these are the value which should be set uh, living with differences that we don't have to be very frank we have nothing of that sort while usa has done quite a lot so the gender issue one is the legal measure another measure the but most important channel is changing the attitude of the student dealing with their diverse background a student coming from one particular region in india has a altogether different notion of how he behaves with the girl than the student who is coming from other areas so now if they are coming together you have to develop uh, educate them and that you can do by introducing curriculum and different pedagogy of intergroup discussion dealing with uh, uh, this issue i think today i read in new york time uh, that the queens college here got number 1 i believe in their ranking of the state there is a very interesting article where the author has pointed out different indicators of uh, judging the standing of the colleges and uh, one of them is of course values what do you teach uh, rather than Uh, how many student of a college get jobs so it's a, it's a very interesting discussion but i think this issue is very lively here but we have not dealt with this issue disparities in academic background once a student enter with a minimum qualification to the university each one of them have a different standing in academic background we have seen in terms of languages language background we have seen in terms of private visa vis publics so the student with a different academic standing is entering into the institutions there is a need that there should be some program for catching up removing some of the handicaps of those students coming from rural area from ethnic background girls coming with a different background so you have to have some support structure we call it a remedial coaching in india but some academic assistance program to those uh, who lag behind and at least give them helping hand so that they can catch up with others um, we have Uh, courses uh, of giving support in language english language uh, some program of giving support to the weaker uh, student but i think uh, it is not very substantial in nature uh, there is a drop out in the particular category of the student from the higher education uh, to a to a greater extent vis a vis others uh, i do not know what kind of uh, approach is uh, used here but i think that is an issue that we are facing let me tell you in the school now one of the most elite school in india now there is 20% reservation for the poor student now those poor student invariably are from a regional background regional language background poor background and they are group with the uh, most elite convent private educated uh, student coming from private school and they are together and those are creating immense pro immense problem but we don't know how to deal with that we have to deal with this Uh, differences we need methodologies of bringing the student together and dealing with their uh, diverse background i think i would like to stop it here what is the way forward what we have in india we have two things a, a, as far as the access problem is concerned we have limited program of financial assistance in case case for private institutions in private institution which survive only on the tuition and uh, and the Uh, support the poor and the meritorious student who get into the these institution on the merit they need some support we have developed some system particularly for indigenous student and poor student and that is scholarship or financial uh, or loan system but we are trying to deal with that but i don't think it is comprehensive enough to deal with the problem of uh, the cost of the higher education but nevertheless we know the way out 
remedial coaching is being used for give, for dealing with the different academic standard of the student. Uh, and it has been successful in many cases. Uh, in my university, I was the in charge of this uh, academic assistance. So I, I, I discovered that there is this, this uniform pattern doesn't help. What you require is the individualized attention to the student, identify his weaknesses, his problem, and then give him a support, him or her a support. So we develop an individualized academic assistance to the student, but that's not the case with large majority of the universities. Students with poor background, with coming from regional languages and rural area, have a tough time to uh, catch up with other, although they possess the minimum potential to be there because they are qualified through the test. But what we terribly lack is, of course, as I say, uh, which is nearly absent, is the program to deal with diversity, uh, which, uh, which uh, is reflected in intergroup divide, discrimination, and even gender harassment. We are beginning to realize this problem, but I think we have not developed the positive education. We have developed legal measures to a certain extent, but uh, the way USA has done and developed multicultural program, I came from University of Massachusetts. They have what is called social justice program. There are courses which are compulsory for undergraduate students. Uh, they are taught about race. They are taught about gender issue. They are ta taught about nationalities. They are taught about color differences and made them sensitive. And, and what is important is to build, a, to increase the capacity and skill of the student to deal with these differences. Even, even, to, uh, even to increase the capacity of the teacher to deal with these differences. Uh, but we don't have much uh, as far as this is concerned. Therefore, I believe that there is, a, there is some learning from uh, interaction with you. Uh, what are the lessons from American experience on access to poor? Uh, please share with me. Diversity, discrimination, gender, and academic support. Um, there, there is one particular project which, uh, you know Obama, Obama Singh project? On in, uh, many of the Americans have applied under this project uh, for research. This Massachusetts University has got this inclusive university. And this is one of the important step in that direction that uh, this will be this, this inclusive university project which uh, is with the University of Massachusetts. They have picked up Indian universities and they will study and suggest uh, some measures for dealing with the diversity and discrimination. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, that was that was very good. I, I learned a whole lot about the Indian higher education system that I didn't didn't know anything about before. Um, and of course, I, I have more questions about that. Uh, and and maybe my first question would be: a lot of the patterns you saw uh, here, do you have data on 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 outcomes? That is, do you see a big difference in performance, whether just in completing school? versus being university versus and also maybe in academic performance. I mean, that is the big, the mantra in the United States right now is a real focus on completion of university rather than just access um, to university. Well, this is a very important question, but uh, unfortunately, uh, and there are no studies on outcomes. But nevertheless, there are some study which brings out that uh, the dropout rates in the colleges of the student coming from rural background, coming with regional languages, and particularly those from indigenous and low caste, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the dropout is relatively high, which means that uh, uh, there, are th there are issues and the problem that they face. Although there is some support, academic support in terms of remedial coaching, but I think there is an issue of dropout. But uh, to be very frank, our educational scientists have not dealt with this issue. The differences in performance, academic performance of various groups, uh, there are not very many studies to be fair. Is it, what, what is the overall dropout rate from university education? In the United States, we're in the range of, you know, maybe 50% complete it in six years, and quite a few people never, never finish. Um, we do we do we don't have the figures at no, ag the aggregate level uh, 
so it will be difficult for me to say uh, the exact number but uh, uh, I can only say that uh, uh, the relative dropout rate is uh, higher among those who are coming from rural area, those who are coming with regional uh, language background. Uh, discipline wise there may be ratios but I have not yep. really seen. Yeah. Uh, another thought that crossed my mind in looking at your data it seemed like a lot of the disparities were really tied to income or wealth. Um, you know, in attendance at private universities, um, yeah. attendance, um, uh, you know, by, by income, uh, uh, quintile. Uh, one question I had is, is, is there a large difference across Indian universities between private and, and public or, or even among the state universities in terms of, of their support? That is, do they have enough resources in terms of you know, whether it's money or, or teaching, are they overcrowded? Is there a big difference between the two? The, uh, the, the typical feature of private education institutions, the university as well as the undergraduate courses is that they are specialized into professional courses. They are specialized into uh, medicine, engineering, management, and several courses of that type, which have immediate employment uh, outcome. And these are, besides the courses, uh, uh, which are expensive in the sense that they are tuition based courses they didn't uh, there are private institu uh, public institution where these institutions uh, these courses are there uh, but more sophisticated more innovative courses you f we will find in private institution where the tuition fee is uh, normally beyond the reach of the yeah. relatively poor but the government has recognized this and uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Education has set up what is called uh, Educational Finance Corporations. And that Educational Finance Corporation doesn't give funding. It, the, fund, the loan for education is to be given by the bank, commercial banks. Mm -hmm. uh, the, min the, the provision is that uh, the finance corporation will provide subsidy on interest. It, does, it doesn't even stand as a guarantee or security. Mm -hmm. So as a result, uh, the loan for education is almost like a commercial loan and therefore not a substantial portion of a uh, uh, student really make you, uh, can make use of it. It is precisely here that I wanted to learn from U.S. experience. I was in Canada and I have discovered a very good system there. Uh, the, the financial support in the form of a loan is is with the government. There is an, there is an agency which is completely funded by the government and the loan is given to the student whosoever want and then there is a repayment cycle I, I presumed and even if there is a default there is a 5% or 10% default that is considered a subsidy yeah. but fairly a good system I have not studied in greater detail I do not know the system here <coughs> uh, uh, yeah. as such but we do recognize that uh, then there are these indigenous communities called scheduled caste or scheduled tribes uh, for them in some state, not all, in some state, the fees in private sector is uh, required to be low, relatively low, mm. not as low as the public institutions, mm. but relatively low, and the entire funding is given by the state government to the private institution. Oh, okay. So it is the financing of private education by the government in a way, but only for the poor, uh, poor and belonging to the indigenous and uh, excluded communities. Mm -hmm. So I think selectively government recognize this problem and they are taking uh, steps but I think uh, we have not yet got the handle of it yeah. to be very frank. Yeah. Well I'm not sure we have either. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Because our system here, uh, our system here is, is we all lending or a large part of lending comes from the federal government now. Uh, we used to have a private guarantee system, more like the commercial one you talked about, but almost all um, lending now comes, at least a certain base of it comes from the federal government. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we do have uh, a rising default rate, in, in partly because of the economic times uh, going on, which is causing, causing people a lot of concern. Um, but, we're, but, but that is our system. Uh, and, of course, we're, we're uh, you know, we have a big state system and, and there's state funding of mm -hmm. both um, four-year universities as well as community colleges and the, the majority of students are in those sorts of institutions. But there is a financial support system 
uh, in terms of loan? There's well, there's two things. There's actually, for the for the lowest of the poor people with an average income below or near the poverty line, there's something called Pell grants that are um, um, a small amount, and they're not large. Uh, they don't cover a large portion of the private institution tuition, but they're available just as grants. And then most students are taking out um, federal loans of one form or another. Yeah, the, the, the problem of comparison is that we, uh, our privatization has come in at a time when our enrollment ratio itself is very low, 17%. Yeah. While, uh, while you will say the enrollment ratio is pretty high, pretty high right? pretty at that level, uh, e even if there are issues and, 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 and there are steps to support them, uh, the gravity of the problem is not that serious as much as it is in our case, that at the level of 17% itself, the education is becoming somewhat difficult for the right. poorer section. That's the, the, the issue. You might even cap it. You might, you're yeah, running into yeah, yeah. Yeah, running to. What other questions that you, you came to ask? What other questions uh, would you want to ask of us? Uh, well, I was first going to ask him to ask his questions. And we'll, we'll, I'll try to give answers, but maybe other people can help out. So. Well, uh, are there certain programs for the academically uh, student coming with a slightly disadvantaged position with respect to academic background? Uh, are there uh, programs of some sort? Uh, almost every university has some kind of program for that, um, both for students coming in when they start with, but also for students who realize once they start that they're having issues. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's illegal to, in the United States, to provide it just to a particular, you know, um, racial group or, or otherwise alone. Um, um, so we ba basically make these open to anybody who, um, from their prior academic performance, there might be issues about whether or not they can succeed. So there is a, there is some mechanism of uh, yes of additional support and help to them. Yeah, but it's done by the university itself. So it's yeah, the private yeah, yeah, it's funded by the private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what about the I mean uh, the the diversity issue, particularly with respect to gender, uh, how how it is dealt in the university system. You, you mean the w within the university? You, within the itself? university, you have girls and boys. Do you face the problem? I'm sorry, I'm posing a question which is not there, the problem here in this uh, university system, but I, I, I have seen that there are courses uh, of sensitization about the gender oh, sure. issues. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Uh, well, some many, some many comment? Okay. Many universities will have programs of, of you know, sensitization types of programs coming in. Um, I mean, I think it, it's also, while we, we certainly have our issues, um, I think it's partly the kids today, students even from the time when I was in university, come with a stronger sense of, of, e uh, of equal treatment and equal you know, quality. It's not to say there aren't still problems, um, but you'll see, you'll see people coming in that way and then you'll see courses that raise those issues and have people discuss them throughout the you know, um, throughout the university curriculum. Uh, the new school has uh, certain courses on multicultural Oh, education. we have lots of courses that yeah. address those sorts of issues. We haven't had, and actually a discussion we've been having about, uh, w uh, you know, precise sensitivity or diversity training is often called in the United States as being required for every student. There are some, my prior institution, we did do that. We had a small amount of that. Um, yeah, let's so let's open ahead. it up. Questions? Why don't you use the mic here? So, right here. You have an extremely large number of undergraduate institutions. So I would assume that despite the large population base, the undergraduate institutions tend to be small in student body and in character contrasted to the universities. Uh, to what extent are the more provincial, more rural undergraduate colleges, uh, less diverse, especially with regard to rural versus urban students and also regarding academic quality? No, even at the undergraduate level, uh, I think the number of colleges are less than the, uh, the supply is less than the demand, uh, and, and particularly of a good quali quality undergraduate program. Therefore. Uh, many of the students, they just try to get admission into urban center and urban colleges. But uh, even in rural areas, 
uh, small town medium town uh, there are no colleges in rural area there are in some cases yes but basically small town and medium town uh, uh, they the, they are these are the colleges we serve the rural population or uh, 70% of our population is rural uh, in the villages Uh, the problem of diversity is there uh, the the student coming from poor background girls problem is lot more uh, likely to be severe there um, uh, because there are not enough hostels and other facilities uh, then of course the indigenous people low caste students those problems are uh, even in uh, colleges which are in medium town and small town okay other questions in urban area on the contrary uh, the economic diversity would be less uh, the, the student coming from middle class and upper middle class yeah. where's the mic here we go go ahead so you have thank you very much because you have at the same time shown the 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 inequalities that still exist but you have shown us as well the progress that has been made in terms of more diversity then you recall the gr 17% and when you look at india in the past 30 years you had a, a, a wonderful economic growth you have an elite much more educated than many of the developing countries you have a diaspora amazing and all you know, american universities you find all this indian professors etc you had very strong personalities as minister of education in the past years and yet india is still 17% enrollment growth where uh, um, rate whereas for example china is now close to 30% and china was coming from nowhere they had uh, university shut for 10 years they they didn't have the same elite etc so is it that india has been too busy with diversity and and not taking enough care about the rest or what is your explanation well there are two aspect uh, i think uh, before the growth uh, before the growth in 2008 to 9 percent growth uh, 80s uh, late later part of 70s and 80s was a very bad period for higher education so much so that various state government has put restriction on recruitment of faculty member in the universities and those restriction remain almost for 15 year so the higher education came under a very s- severe pressure during the 80s and early part of 90s and that has really created a problem for us but when the growth picked up uh, uh, to 9 and 10 percent it is precisely during this period that is 2006 that the budget to the higher education uh, increase almost 11 fold uh, and uh, the all the state government were asked to remove the restriction on recruitment of faculty all the state governments provincial government were asked to increase the number of the university now for example state like andhra pradesh uh, is now setting up university in each of the district uh, central universities when in 2006 were only 15 but dr manmohan singh declared 30 central university in one go it never happened in the history of last 50 year at one go you are setting up 30 central university so as on today we have now 44 university in those 15 university were set up within a period of 3 year now the higher growth rate the government imposed what is called higher education cess and collected the money and devoted to higher education sector so but now growth has again come down to 5% so uh, in the 12th plan that is 2000 11 to 2017 the higher education uh, is slightly uh, allocation is going down so i, I think 80s and uh, 80s caused the damage but now in 2000 we have been trying to uh, revive it as far as the this di- this dichotomy of uh, presence of indian academic in usa and elsewhere and at the same time uh, 17% you are very right see the unfortunately uh, India has an history of uh, unequal access to education not only higher education education uh, almost till the beginning of the 19th century till british has came and introduced a public education system set up in public school and colleges education was barred for women and low caste as a matter of custom and as a matter of 
social ideology. So, uh, the history of uh, for access for education to women is a very recent history. I was the chairman of the UGC and I used to go to the universities, say 150 year old university and the vice chancellor would come and show with me, show to me with a great pride, this is our first woman student and they will have a portrait there and that is, what is that period? Something like 1870. So, and high caste. The high caste has access to education exclusively and low caste and many other were excluded through restriction. As a result, you have one particular section which has a history of academics for 2000 years. And then this is the section we jump upon the English education when the Britishers came. So it is extremely, extremely uh, good class in terms of exposure to education. It is this class which comes here and compete. Uh, in any way. So, but the other one is also picking up now, but this uh, uh, small, extremely elite and exposed to higher education section is the outcome of our past, where we confined education to a particular section, uh, put restriction, literal restriction we put. Uh, as a result, that class has now an advantage. Either you have a private or public or professional education, this class has an advantage to the social capital uh, is so high and strong that this has an advantage. Therefore, a bulk of this comes to USA and Europe and you find their presence. In, uh, in the universities that I have visited, on an average you get 20 to 25, 30 uh, Indian faculties uh, in the universities. But most of them are from this background. Uh, yeah, is, is there any part of India that you could say leads the way in terms of, uh, of higher education uh, uh, attainment or, or education generally uh, as well as gender equality. Uh, you mentioned an, initi an initiative underway in Andhra Pradesh, uh, but I'm thinking of Kerala also, you know, which has you know, quite a reputation you know, in, in this area. Uh, could you comment on that? Yeah, you are very right. Uh, Kerala is an outstanding example of very high enrollment ratio in higher education because they uh, they emphasize uh, the higher education uh, and most of it is in public. They allocate a higher proportion of their national income, state income to education. Um, then uh, remittances play an important role. About one fourth of population is Christian. We have a uh, and Jesuit, we have a very strong uh, tradition of setting up education institutions. So, but Kerala's model is there that they strengthen their public education system. As their uh, is the state domestic product increases, a larger portion of their uh, increased income they devoted to on education, health, and other social services. As a result, the educational level in Kerala is very high. Uh, same is the case with Tamil Nadu uh, and to certain extent Andhra. But there also you find a, a huge intergroup variations, in K even in Kerala. The low cost access to enrollment is still lower. Isn't there, it doesn't Kerala also have some um, uh, reputation for gender equality as well? Yeah, of course. In fact, uh, gender equality is uh, one of our successful story which we do not emphasize, to be very frank. You look at the urban data, the enrollment ratio of the girls and the boys is almost close to each other. That is, there is a because there is an informal affirmative action policy. We don't say it because formally it is for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe, but informal affirmative action policy whereby you emphasize and create sort of facilit several facilities and provisions for the girls, uh, that has helped. I, I, as the chairman of the UGC, uh, during that period, I think the hundreds and thousands of hostels were created in rural area for the girls, where they got a protected atmosphere, scholarships, uh, then cycles because they have to travel to a small town or a larger village to go to school. So cycle are being provided, scholarship are being provided. So there is an uh, affirmative action policy in favor of girls which has helped them to pick up. Uh, and But in rural area they are still lagging behind. You can see the disparities. In urban area they have catch up uh, with the boys. And Yes, you are raising... Uh, Thank you so much for um, the talk and for your research, Dr. Tharat. It's so nice to see you again as well. I think, you know, the, 
in my estimation at least, you're almost singular in your approach to actually disaggregating this kind of data and complicating the picture of India's um, quote unquote success in these issues, especially along the lines that you've shown. And, and um, one of the questions I wanted to bring to the table is just how much do you think higher education what, what role are you giving higher education in Indian society to act as um, a vanguard on some of the issues that you're talking about? Because I think one of the main differences or sort of unique situations in India is that policies and the law, especially affirmative action or reservation policies, have actually created this intersociability in a way in education that doesn't exist in society, right? And your own surveys have shown, for example, on the caste issue, just how much segregation remains, how much untouchability remains, such that you get to a point where these laws actually provide for that interaction, but socially there hasn't been any um, other forms or, or ways to allow for that smooth transition. So. In what ways do you see the university as leading the charge on doing what society is not already doing or catching up to? Or do you think society itself needs to change its attitudes before these kinds of ideas can even penetrate the university itself? See, the, uh, the, the problem of uh, the issue of higher education in India has some dimension, some aspect which need to be emphasized. One important issue is, of course, the uh, the affirmative action policy for the indigenous communities and the low caste has helped, as you are rightly said, tremendously in the promotion of their higher education. The entry into higher education institutions in a desirable courses. There's an excellent book by Professor Wiskoff, I think, uh, from the from US. I don't know the university. The affirmative action policy in in edu higher education in India. Uh, in a desirable courses like e uh, engineering, medical, management, where there is a huge competition, uh, the affirmative action policy and quota has helped uh, the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe to uh, get access into this uh, uh, higher education. And to, they, to that extent, that has brought a mobility. Whatever little middle class that you see among this group is because of reservation and affirmative action policy in higher education and then the affirmative action policy in the employment. So that takes them to the uh, upward uh, mobility. But uh, as, as regard the overall picture, that the point that you, uh, that you have mentioned is that I think the, 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 the privatization of higher education institution and school education institution at the time when your enrollment issue is 17 uh, is an is a issue which is, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, uh, the, the, at this level, you should provide an opportunity to everybody. But uh, government is not able to do that. Uh, what should have been done possibly, I mean, I have only one example of, uh, I have not studied the American system, but Europe, uh, where the entire higher education and school education is under the public domain. Uh, what they did, I have studied historically, that as the, uh, I mean, Sweden was as bad as India in early 70s, I think. But uh, as their national income increases in European countries, a larger portion of that, uh, a substantial portion of that increased income was spent on strengthening the public education system, which we did not do. We neglect under the pretext that we don't have money, and therefore we promoted private uh, sector. Uh, and as a result, you have one of the best education system in Europe now, I mean, a public education system, because they strengthen successively. Uh, and uh, in our case, we neglect it. So we are. The, the, our, our crisis is that the state has not allocated as much as it should have been uh, to education and also to health. I think that debate is going on. Now, we have private sector, which is also which has created quite a good capacity in higher education. We have a public sector, but public sector is lagging behind and uh, quality of education is an issue. Private sector quality is reasonably well, but the issue of access is... Uh, uh, is a serious issue and and we have not dealt with uh, those issues through either financial assistance package or by other ways. So that issue is still there and which we have not realized. We began to realize but I think it's going to create serious problem for us. 
because uh, I mean nowhere in the developed world uh, inequality in education uh, beca became a source of in uh, inequality in e economic and opportunities inequality in opportunities you allow everybody to develop the educational capacities and then li you leave it to the market uh, leave it to take them the chances but you are not creating inequality in capacity building and enhancement in india what is precisely happening is that we are creating inequal access to higher education which is automatically will lead to inequal access to employment and economic opportunity and it will have an impact on uh, poverty reduction it will have an impact on social mobility compared to china in china whenever there is an economic growth and increase in the employment because of high level of education uh, the the literacy rate is very very high so higher secondary and higher education now there are problem in china also but those who get education can make use of those employment opportunities uh, in india even if there are uh, employment opportunity it is those who have those uh, qualification can get opportunities the others do not so as a result uh, uh, the economic inequalities are created because of inequality in education i think that's a serious issue which we we will have to apply our mind I let's take one one last question i have just one question dr torati which also combines with your career to you started with jnu as a professor and then you with the Un university grants commission you have also created certain structural uh, promotive actions which are for the benefit of higher education and to reduce the inequality my question to you is now is there any debates in india about the reduction of social science teaching in higher education you are uh, heading now uh, a council of social science research and we are in one way emphasizing a lot on engineering technology and other areas uh, medicine law what about the social science which actually will address to the issues which she also mentioned about the society the kind of society which is there in equal society well social education is surviving and and in this is is fairly good in public universities and public institution uh, most of the private institutions are only professionals so to that extent in the private education institution social science is taking back seats yeah certainly well thank you very much uh, professor torres it's excellent thank you thank you